Welcome back. Our last session for day one of the symposium is funding of sport and the future of governance. The panel will look at the significant sports governance and funding issues prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and the state play now. The effect of COVID-19 on funding strategies, federations and organizations could adopt with a likely decrease in funding and viable alternative sources of funding. Our panelists for this session are Ms. Deepti Bopaya, Executive Director at the Go Sports Foundation and a former athlete who has previously represented Karnataka in tennis and basketball. Ms. Roma Khanna, Tournament Director, FIFA Under-17 Women's World Cup India 2020, the first Indian to be appointed as a Tournament Director for a FIFA tournament. She was also the head of venues and operations during the Under-17 Men's World Cup in 2017. Mr. Adil Sumariwala, President of the Athletics Federation of India, Vice President of the Indian Olympic Association and first Indian to be elected as one of the members of the IAAF Council. Mr. Yannick Colasso, Chief Business Officer at Fancode and former Vice President and Managing Director at NBA India. Mr. Desh Gaurav Sekri, Officer on Special Duty at Niti Ayo and author of the book, Not Out, The Incredible Story of the Indian Premier League. And the moderator for the session, Mr. Joy Bhattacharya, Chief Executive Officer, Pro Volleyball League, former Project Director, FIFA Under-17 World Cup 2017, former Team Director at Kolkata Knight Riders, and also author of a children's book with his son titled Junior Premier League. If you do have any questions during this session, do type them in to the Q&A box below and our panelists will try to answer some of them. Over to Joy and the panelists. Thanks all for being here. As I said, the one advantage I have is that uh, almost all, in fact, all the panelists fairly well known to me. Okay, so we have all the panelists out here and the good news is, as you must have heard from the introductions, this is a brilliant panel because we have everybody from people who run federations to people who are funding and trying to create an OTT platform in sports to somebody who's running the biggest uh, yeah, FIFA event in India, the first Indian woman to run a FIFA, Indian to run a FIFA event. Deepti, they won a Russia Puraskar for their work, Go Sports Foundation, and Desh, who's done some stellar work in sports law, and his book on the IPL is something that I hugely recommend. So that's the good news. The bad news is that I have decided that today my moderation style is full Arnab Goswami. So if, you guys, <laughs> so if you guys get a word in sideways, it's because I was off my game. So, you know, I wanted to start off and talk about this because I was lucky enough to start sport and television at a time when in 1996, around when I started, there was a film called Forrest Gump. Uh, sorry, it's not Forrest Gump, it was in 1994. It was a film called Jerry Maguire. And we went to see it. And of course, the villain of the film looked very much like the person I worked with in IMG, but that's not the story. The story was there was this chap called Cuba Gooding Jr. who was Rod Tidwell, you know, who was this American football player. And he always had one question. He asked, show me the money. Okay. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to try and find out where that money is in Indian sport, what we need to do to get more of it out here. Do changes in governance. Does the structure of Indian sport as it is today allow us to do very much with it? And uh, many more questions, wherever else, CSR funding, how to bring big tournaments into India. There's so much more exciting things, OTT platforms and what Fancode is doing out here, what federations are doing. So what I'll do is I'll start straight off by first asking, and I'm going to go to the ladies first. I'm going to go with Roma first. Uh, you know, we are all going to talk. This is now a post-COVID world. It's, it's, you know, a pandemic has hit us. But Roma, what were things like before COVID? Because it's very important to know where we were before this thing started, before seeing where we are going. So 
were things okay there were things good enough there was your event going well do you feel that the you know infrastructure indian sport is was building at that point in time absolutely joy uh, if you remember on our second november 2019 when we did the official emblem launch for the tournament we knew we had a product at that point of time which was fairly unknown to the indian public so we knew there had to be some amount of publicity and we had to do it in a different way from the first ever fifa tournament that was held in india in 2017 that set the tone yes we hit the pause button uh when around uh, 12th of march when who declared a global pandemic uh we were to an extent about to close a national supporter for the tournament and then suddenly things pause and things have been on a pause the good thing for us is also every stakeholder who uh with us is committed to the tournament we postponed the dates we start next year from 17th of february and the objective is yes health and safety comes first and now we have to gain back that momentum yes the advantage that i would see with women's football again is it's a new product so we have the ability to innovate and do things differently even with the gap that we have faced and the tournament since it's all about positivity the message is about joy hope happiness the launch of women's football in india this 3 month has hit us hard but again we remain optimistic thank you thank you so much deepthi you've been uh, i mean this is a is been a time when you've been getting together and you know go sports with that rashtriya puraskar last year being awarded by the president some fantastic momentum building there and was there something happening there which you think now this probably got a bit stalled yeah uh, good afternoon everyone and great to be on this panel and um, i think uh, yes there have been lot of our plans that have got stalled especially the olympics moving to next year i think adil uh, will totally feel what you're talking about because there was so much of planning preparation we were all really looking forward to the olympics and there was this whole momentum of uh csr funding coming in brands investing into sport there was a lot of um so much happening in sport and we were quite positive about the kind of funding that we would get but then in the last uh five six months um there's complete you know standstill of there's really no income coming in at all because a lot large part of our funding at least as foundations come through csr and very little come from a very small percentage comes from high net worth individuals you can't really depend on large uh, format funding so uh, csr funding in in that manner has definitely uh, you know stopped to some extent maybe for some time uh, but given that olympics has been pushed to the next year it, it it depends on so many factors now i mean it depends on the vaccine it depends on international competition it depends on low domestic competition so i think um at least till things start moving at our end it's going to take some time but you know like roma said we are optimistic always we're positive we do hope that things change maybe there are new formats of funding that come through uh, because of this phase uh, you know people start investing into national sport a lot more national level tournaments a lot more maybe we find a large number of talent in this period when you can't really step out i'm sure we'll have to come up with different things but it has taken a beating adil uh, i know i'm going to come to you next because i think that you've already you would have had your tokyo recce trip ticket already bought you would have got everything sorted out and then suddenly all this happens how are you guys taking it i mean where were we before we just hit you and where are we now we were well prepared as a federation with our team uh, to get to the olympic games everything was planned out for our athletes uh, they had already started moving to to europe and other countries where they started their training we had to pull them back and bring them back home safely um we had a complete plan till tokyo however at this point it's a standstill we brought everybody back especially the the probables they are all hold up in nis patiala and nis bangalore uh, we are keeping them absolutely safe pretty much uh uh in quarantine and now they've started training about 3 weeks ago till then they were not allowed to train 
uh, we are not allowing people to leave the camp. You're not allowing outsiders to come into the camp. You're trying to keep, keep our athletes as safe as possible. But having said that, we've already worked out plan A, plan B, plan C, hoping that the Olympic Games will happen, will happen on time. And uh, we work backwards. And we're saying if things open up by July, if things open up by August, if things open up by September, we presently planned our first domestic competition in September, September, October. From November onwards, uh, they go into pre-season again. January onwards, if they can travel abroad, we've set up those training programs. So, so we worked backwards with two or three different options. At this point, all the goalposts are shifting, as uh, Deepti said. So, so we, are, we, are keeping, we are keeping a flexible plan, but it's all documented on paper. So we hope the Olympic Games will happen next year and, and we are ready for it. Basically, every federation needs to do yoga to have, you know, be able to twist and turn and actually manage to sort of all these eventualities. Yeah, because there are a lot of balls in the air. But Yannick, coming to you, I mean, you're running fan code. It's, it's you know, there's Dream 11, there's fan code. Fan code depends a lot on live sport coming in, live sport being streamed in. And uh, two things. One is that, yes, there is, you know, it, it would have been a challenge. But was it also an opportunity? You know, the way we've looked at it and obviously the, the, the challenges for people who have on-ground events or, the, or were planning towards it, like, you know, Roma, Ditti and Ajay are different. But the challenges that we had were essentially that, you know, live sport, which is the uh, core of what our business is built around and all the sports industries built around, was suspended for a period of time. Um, the opportunity for us that we are a very young company. So, um, you know, as we were building and we were a great set of uh, engineers and fan coders as part of our team. So we actually use this time and we started with the principle that said live sports going to come back, right? That's our business. We know that the industry is going to come back. We know that the, the sport is going to come back. So we said that instead of us sitting around waiting for it to come back and saying what we can do, how do we accelerate what we are trying to build around fan code, the, the platform we're trying to build. So we actually have accelerated some of our building, which we were trying, we would have done in the last, in the next year, we've actually done it in three months, just because our engineers have been really focused on building these platforms up. Uh, and, you know, fortunately for us, and it's unfortunate for most other sports, uh, sports uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, in tech companies, uh, you have the ability, a much more, much better ability to work from home and work efficiently from home. So we've been doubling down on that, trying to build our product uh, uh, around it, trying to you know, make some estimates as to how, um, you know, as Deepthi said, the post-COVID world, how sport would be presented. How do we look at fan engagement? How do we look at fan experiences uh, with sport coming out of uh, you know, all these restrictions post-COVID? And how do we actually use technology to improve those experiences to make sure that people are still engaged? That's what we've been really focused on. Fabulous. And, you know, one of the two things, one is that I'm delighted that you have your favorite jersey is the Lakers jersey, considering that is my favorite basketball team. Yes. So it's nice to see yes. another Lakers supporter out there. Yes. Not too many of them in India. But uh, the second part of it is also I, what I love to see here is, and whatever it is that the four people I've spoken to so far, the one thing that I'm hearing from them is whatever is it is a positivity. It's an optimism that, okay, things are bad. We are not going to sit and cry out here. It's not doom and gloom out here. I see no tears. I see a certain amount of pragmatism saying, okay, this has happened to us. You know, we are not going to walk away from it. This has already happened and go forward. But Desh, you are in a very different position. You're in a position where with the Niti Aayog, you have a position to actually frame policy. And in some ways, and I, I don't mean it in a, this thing, in some ways, this might even be an opportunity to, you know, because there's a pause in Indian sport to be able to look at a few things and say, to recommend change, an opportunity to maybe look at the sports code. Has it been like that? Is this been an opportunity as well as a fairly difficult situation? So, Joy, first, uh, thank you for having me in this discussion. And uh, knowing your penchant for very difficult questions, I'm going to give a disclaimer straight up. Uh, I'm speaking today in my personal capacity and not on behalf of the government. So these opinions are totally my own. Uh, but having said that, you know, I'm really glad to see the various different facets that uh, all four panelists before me have covered. And I think in a situation like this, you do have to be optimistic. And I think from the perspective of the government, it, it's really no different. So while I'm not 
completely or entirely privy to what exactly the policy decisions uh, that are on the table as of now. There's one recent development that I think uh, gives us a good indication of where exactly the, the government feels uh, sports is in the priority list. And that is um, where they've recently come up uh, with the decision to take forward the PPP for the Jawaharlal Nehru Stadium. They've put up the transaction advisor document. They are going to take it forward. Um, so at a time like this, when you're actually taking development uh, in sport as a priority for the ministry and for SAI, I think, I think that's a very good sign. Unfortunately, there are many things that the pandemic has brought to the fore where uh, the government can't do a lot besides give SOPs and uh, facilitate a safety protocol, a return to action, a return to training kind of a protocol. But I think wherever there is a provision or, or the ability for the government to take a strong stance and support uh, sports returning. I'm confident that they will do so. Okay, thank you. And uh, the reason we were smiling is that Roma Khanna and me have spent more time than we'd like to roaming that Jawala Nair Stadium, <laughs> as would Deepti, considering Sai is there, and Saad Adil would have spent a fair amount of time <laughs> there as well. Yannick, you've probably also been there in SAI. So it's a, it's like almost familiar territory. Anyone in that area in Indian sport has sort of walked those corridors very, very often. But Desh, I'll stay with you for a moment. And okay, before I stay with you, one rule, because I don't want this to be a series of monologues. If at any point in time, when one person is answering, if the any, if you want to immediately after that, want to add to that, just put up your hand and, you know, I'll come to you. I may say that I am a follower of Arnab, but maybe I just might be able to, you might just be able to catch my eye. Who knows? You know, life is like that. <laughs> so Desh, I'm going to stay with you for a moment and say, you know, the reason why we are doing this is because we are looking at the funding in Indian sport. And the truth of it is that there hasn't been much funding to start with. So Indian sport, sport is hugely underfunded to start with compared to almost any developed sporting country. So, you know, one is getting, you know, private partnership into it. Is there a point in time where we are beginning to say that sport being a totally state subject is a disincentive for the central government to put in more money into it? Is there something that can be done about it? Because it is something that a lot of people feel very strongly about and if nothing else, I'd like to know the answers. See, when it comes to uh, to funding the sports sector, I think uh, yes, the government has a has a great uh, deal of uh, intervention at the state level or even at the central level when it comes to grassroots and uh, when it comes to uh, working with uh, with DP or with Roma to get to get things together. But with the private sector. Uh, across all sophisticated sports jurisdictions where a lot of the of the big money, so to speak, comes. So, in fact, I've been closely following the jurisdictions that are resuming um, sporting to whatever, to whatever extent, especially the US. So, I mean, I think the UFC was one of the first, uh, first major leagues or promotions to, to stage a comeback. So the role again of the government there was to ensure that, uh, say for example, Florida or Nevada or California were able to give them a ecosystem where they were able to conduct numerous tests. They were able to get sanitized stadiums or arenas for them to be able to participate and then do the best they could to make sure all protocols were in place. But the money has to come from the leagues. And, and I think that's, that's where, uh, or from professional sports, if not just leagues. And I think that's, that's where we'll have to look at first. And again, I go back to where the government will play a facilitating role. Ah, good. Adil, you're coming in. I was anyway going to come to you because whenever it comes to money and sport, I, Adil, I feel for you because in an odd year, that means that normally in a 19 or a 21 or a 23, nobody ever remembers you. They only remember you either during the Asian <laughs> Games time or the Olympics time. So you're, you're what I call the even-eared man for me. So yes, please go on. So actually... Like actually, let me tell you, the government has done a fantastic job of funding. Now, now let me let me make you understand how government fund. Government does not fund the federations, so there is not one single rupee, as people think, comes to the national federations. The government pays for my athletes' coaching, for the coaches, for the foreign coaches, for the foreign trips, etc. So. What happens is there is this concept of um, there is this concept of oh federations have been given so much money not a single rupee. Now, funnily, funnily, 
last year the government the sports department returned monies monies were not spent the sports department returned monies back to the treasury now that is the sad part because when you go to and, and they give you decent amount of money and i'm going to say i think the government is doing a great job the corporates have failed us completely the corporates have failed us completely and i'll come to that when we talk about csr and i feel for dipti on this the government is job i think is to create the infrastructure i have to disagree with uh, desh i think the state's job is to create grassroot the state's job is to organize events at grassroot and district level there is a district sports officer available in every district the 700 districts of in 700 odd districts of india i think the central government should focus on elite athletes should focus on creating that world class infrastructure in in certain centers across the country where our elite athletes from all sports can go and train get the best best of sports science get the best of sports medicine get the best treatment get the best coaches and have the best infrastructure so i think we need and i think that while we think that the state and the center and it being a state subject being in the concurrent list etc i think we what we really need to do is if each one takes their own responsibility the state today 90% of the states are doing nothing and a state or two is doing 200% so so that's the the disparity that is happening and then the central government is trying to get in to to balance out that and i think that that's the wrong thing to do so that's what is my take on sports funding at the moment Deepthi. and i don't know whether desh agrees with me or not but he he sits on the high table so he would know better but i go with a begging bowl to the ministry of sports every year actually next week i have to go for my actc with a begging bowl again to get some money out of them don't worry i i completely understand it's a standard thing with every federation but as as we come back to and we'll come back to this point of money going back when there's so little money in indian sport and the tragedy of money going back we'll talk about that later but first dipti i think it's a combination of what desh said and with what adil said because uh, if you look at the way the support structures are currently i think uh, i fully second that the amount of support that the central government has started putting in to elite athletes especially through the top scheme uh, that's like world class support i think a lot of other countries also don't get that kind of uh, quantum of money in terms of support for their training so i think that is happening at that level uh but you know it's again finding that talent across different sports today if you look at the olympics there are probably very few events we participate in uh but what you know an organization like us is attempting to do is look at the diversification of from a medal uh, at least from a qualification perspective so but that's why we're investing in fencing taekwondo um you know we're investing in alternate sports which is not a medal prospect currently so that at least the number of people who qualify increase but that story does not stay, uh, sell typically you know to a corporate because at the end of the day they want to see someone they'll back someone who goes to the medal but i think uh, the corporates that we had the opportunity to work with over the last 10 years uh, we are extremely grateful to them because they in, in some sense they've understood this is nation building through sport and they've not looked at it as a performance or medal aspect so we've had that uh comfort of actually investing in the athlete in the ecosystem and helping that grow but yes today when livelihoods and just staying alive is important it is understandable that a corporate has to change gears and look at what is the most important aspect but we are only requesting that you know don't stop funding keep some 50 60% for us because if we get in on two months olympics is happening will be stuck again and there's so much that an athlete today has already got used to and now we're just trying to maintain their performance at in their houses you know those who are probable in athletics are in their respective places but across other sports everybody are back home from a mental perspective uh, you know it's a very different zone that an athlete is in today they they've never had an time where they don't know in two weeks where they're going to be or on which flight or which hotel so they are completely there's so much of anxiety that all athletes are going through and just 
transitioning from maintenance to performance is going to be a very big challenge for everybody who's involved in uh, elite sport giving that Ol olympics dates are out but we don't know whether it will happen or not so i feel from a funding uh, perspective we have to find a balance you know i understand there are other situations that are very important even from a government standpoint if they suddenly start supporting other aspects you know people are like people are dying why is the money going into another area so we understand but if there's some sort of a balance so that we don't have to start from zero again we start from 50 i think that would help fantastic and i think that's a very impassioned you and you you said it right maybe i mean what the interesting thing about it is though you spoke about the corporates that you've spoken about it may be a small minority but those you have managed to convince that it's more nation building than immediate results because otherwise you're just taking bites of the cherry on top that's that's really not investing in sport that's like that's being taking advantage of sport when it's relevant and cultural top of mind but roma funding for you and i mean i've been a part of fifa this thing. funding is the, the big effort it is the biggest effort in fifa so how do you look at it well uh... Joy, as you've known me, I'm more of a glass half full kind of a person than a glass half empty. Uh, but uh, it is going to be challenging. We are, uh, I'm being completely realistic in terms of bringing in private sponsorship, national supporters. It is going to be a huge challenge. But on the other side, what I would say the plus that has been and what we've seen is also the minute we announced that, you know, we are, we were, because of the compelling reasons, we were forced to shift the tournament, postpone it by a few months. Uh, everyone, right from the sports minister of the country to Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports to each of the host cities, they all immediately connected with us and they said it was the right decision to make. Considering the circumstances, they fully support us. And also to an extent we have, what do you say, so to say, Next year, when we come back, we would be the first tournament in India, a national World Cup event. So the country's prestige relies on it to show India on a more positive foot, not just about football, women's football. It would be about country as a whole, celebration as a whole. So if we come in from a government perspective, whether it is the central government or whether it's the host cities, everyone knows that after this period of turmoil, pain, the struggles that we as a country and globally that we've been through comes a time for celebration, for joy, for hope. And that's what we see with them. And uh, again, I'm going back to the glass half full. It's something once things settle down, we would like to talk to companies who would want to come and be part of that, be part of the celebration of healing and of uh, I bring again peace and joy. Peace and joy. Joy is a good word to end with always in this discussion. I absolutely have no problem with that. But Yannick, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to uh, ask you a slightly more difficult question. These ladies have answered superbly on their subject. But I'm going to come to you on something that Adil raised, which is, he said something which is that the corporates have absolutely failed us. The government has done a great job. The corporates have absolutely failed us. You've been there. You've looked at it from a very, you've looked at it from a government point of view. You've we worked in you know, sports before that, sport before that, you sport after that. Do corporates, I mean, do corporates really have a responsibility to do anything? Is it their business? I mean, why would a corporate this thing? And do you agree with that statement? Yeah, I, I, I think that's the that's the key question, right? Um, why do we expect corporates to automatically donate money to sport? There has to be a compelling reason, right? I mean, it's the same challenge with the said about governments, right? If a government has a budget of 100, why should they spend even a single paisa on sport? When, you know, poverty is at its all-time high, unemployment is high, we have a fiscal deficit, maybe they're more important things. But you make those decisions. And the government says that we have to allocate some money for sport because it's an important part of nation building. The same way I think corporates, when they look at the CSR fund, it's the same challenge. When you have a CSR fund, the question is, why don't you spend all 100% of it, for example, on, um, you, know, uh, you know, improving sanitation conditions in, in, in poor poor clean and uh, clean water, food. Uh, I've seen that most uh, corporates who actually get behind sport, it's because of personal passion. It's people who genuinely believe and love sport. And this is from the CSR perspective. Uh, from a sponsorship perspective and putting advertising dollars out to invest in sport, 
I think the sport has to compete with everyone else, right? I mean, in the sense that this is, you know, we are a capitalist economy. So if, uh, you know, uh, football should be competing with cricket, cricket should be competing with basketball, uh, basketball should be competing with soap operas on television. Uh, I think uh, it's a, a, you know, as a marketing person of a, of a corporate, it's your responsibility. It's what you're paid to do is to make decisions which are um, beneficial for your shareholders and beneficial for your shareholders is return on investment. So I think, give, you know, building models which give significant return of investment, show value, that's, I think, the responsibility of stakeholders in sport. And, uh, you know, a corporate will then, from a sponsorship perspective, you know, they'll invest in it or not invest in it if, if there's enough returns in it. Desh, as usual, I have to ask you the difficult questions because, you know, as you say, you're speaking your personal capacity and so it's easier to skewer you than anyone else. But <laughs> if you had to look at this and say that, look, sport, in Indian sport, there's, there's absolutely no doubting that Indian sport doesn't have enough money in it. There is not enough money in the system to really what we call the critical mass of money, only some sports have it, the rest of them are just in that stage where they'll, they'll sustain, but they'll never grow because they're stuck in that. And let me add to that very poor officialdom, very you know tough structures, a lot of things going. What, how would you improve this? What is the first thing that you'd look at? And the reason I ask you also is because you've examined those you know sporting systems of fair amount of countries around the world. You've looked at the UK model, which was very good during the Olympics and after the US model, the Australian model. What can we do? And I'm sure that those models may not exactly apply, but there's so much to learn from that. So, so again, uh, if I go back to the last point that I'd made uh, to your last question, I, I think if you look at any other jurisdiction, what you find is that it's a top-down model where professional sports lead the way, they get the revenues, and then those leagues sustain grassroots and again, the government supports. I don't think there's a demand issue uh, in India for viewership. I don't think there's a demand issue in terms of consuming, even advertising um, when the time comes. Uh, like I said, I've been closely observing the US. I've been closely observing the, the European leagues resuming. So the, a small example, the most recent UFC fight uh, event that was staged in Las Vegas, they got 1 million views, which is about two and a half times or three times of what a typical card uh, with that caliber of uh, participation would be. Uh, so this was uh, Calvillo versus I. Uh, then, then again, you're seeing a very interesting article I read was um, about the US presidential elections and how because of the limitations on public rallies and on actually campaigning from door to door, the campaigns for Senate and the presidential elections are actually looking to consume all advertising space for the leagues as in when they resume, simply because they feel that that's the captive audience, which is most likely to be uh, the voter base they're hoping to target. So I, the challenge in India has been that because of the pandemic, the emerging revenue streams, they're more or less stuck. So, you know, as it is, we have, and, and I mean, you would, you're, you're heading one of the, the newest, most exciting leagues. The challenges remain in terms of, you don't get broadcast revenue very easily. Um, gate receipts and merchandising is something which is negligible but was increasing now with the pandemic we're back to square one i mean you're literally going to have uh, empty empty stadiums merchandising of course um, is going to be another issue so i would actually go back to to what abhinav bindra had said at uh, i think at an online session that he had with sai when he was speaking to certain officials in sai that we have to actually have to an inward looking uh, model where we we push domestic competition. We build the infrastructure, as Adil was saying, at the state and uh, central level. And then we find ways to, to generate revenue. You know, the challenge with the sports ecosystem across the world right now is nobody is making money out of the stakeholders. Even stadium owners can't make money. Where, where a league is shut, they can't even rent it out for, for events or for concerts. So I can't say I have the answers, but um, I mean, it has to be creative and... I think everyone kind of needs to come to the table and figure out a way that survival and sustainability is, is ensured. And I know I've not answered your question exactly to the point, but <laughs> that's the best I've got. Yeah, I mean, now. look, if you knew the exact answer, you would have quickly all gone and <laughs> done it and finished off with everything. Other than you. And I'd have my second book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Adil. 
No, I think Yagnik is absolutely right. Why should corporate put in any money? I mean, why should a marketer put in money? The marketer will see uh, he, has, he has to give his shareholders return. He's absolutely right. But there are two aspects. One of these same guys, the same, same head, uh, head honchos, when I meet them socially, they're talking about, oh, why has India not won medals? Hello, hello. How much money did you put in to that effect? Zero. But yet you want to sit in like an armchair critic and ask me those questions. Why are India? Why is India not winning medals? What have you done? Nothing. If you have CSR money, you built your own hospital. You've done your own thing. So you 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 brought that money back into the system for your own own purposes. So I'm not saying nothing wrong with building a hospital, but I'm saying that there is CSR money. And uh, if, if Dipti wants to talk a little about CSR money, I'll give you some facts and figures at that point. There is CSR money available. Do you want nation building? If you are a corporate, is it not part of what you want to do? You are getting so much from the nation. Do you want to do nation building? 60% of your population is below 40 years. Do you not want, do you want them to become junkies? Or do you want them to become young, strong people who follow sport, healthy people? So my, that, my, my pain is that as I, I run a media company. For me, it's, it's return on investment. If, I, if, if my client spends 10 rupees, he wants 12 rupees in return for it. That's what he demands of me. I understand that part of it. But then I don't want the big, big head on shows. I mean... You know, again, it takes, and what, uh, I don't know who said personal interest, whether Yadnik said or uh, Desh Gaurav said, is personal interest. For example, the marathons that happened, it now that is happening, there was one guy called Mr. Neil Chatterjee in Standard Chartered Bank who took the punt and said, we will do the biggest marathon. Just one guy. And today... Today, look, there are, do you know there are something like 3,000 road races in India? What a revolution. It takes 10 to 15 years. But somebody has to take that punt for the country. And today you are having a healthier nation. So, uh, Yagnik, I completely agree with you, but my pain is a little different. Yeah, so, yeah, before I go to him, it's he's Yannick, and I think... Yeah, Yannick, I, sorry. He's probably born around the 80s when a certain French player, tennis player was doing really well for himself. <laughs> Dipti, I'm coming straight to you because I know this is something that you have. You have a lot of skill in the game. Tell me, Dipti. And I have, I have a supplementary for you after you finish. So I think, uh, you know, we can keep arguing about um, how much money needs to come into sport and who needs to put into sport. But I feel if that, you know, like the, you spoke about the UK lottery system. I think that's an incredible system of how UK... Uh, fun sport over there and it it was really a turnaround for them itself in during the London 2012 Olympics it funded that and it funded 2016 and they saw some excellent results uh, but there is a system in place which is beyond stakeholders and that then you apply for those grants and then you get it into you know different uh, organizations so I feel that as a nation we need to either say that we'll have a percentage earmarked for sport under the entire CSR thing because only 1.5 to 2 percent actually comes in and you have from when CSR started in 2013 to till 2020 you're talking about 50,000 crores available so there's a lot of money available you know but it's not coming into sport and whoever has done it has done it out of their own interest out of their thing it's not a movement so in some sense yes I fully agree with Yannick, it has, there has to be some return on investment, there has to be, uh, there has to be that thought process, but it has to be long term, because sport, I may invest for five years, and I may not even qualify because of an injury. So as a brand, you need to come up with the most innovative ways of uh, deriving value of your investment, you know, so I keep using this word called cause marketing, where can we marry the two in some way and see how the brand gets their due because obviously the marketing person is going to want that uh, ROI uh, at least people you know looking at that uh, brand but then the athlete also needs that money that has to come into their sport otherwise we'll keep complaining every four years uh, that we don't have medals and we'll see uh, you know at a top level a lot of money for few sports but it will never trickle down and we'll never be able to create a movement. 
no yeah okay I before coming to adil just uh, uh, the thing about one of the things you said that this trickle down i'll go there okay i'll go into it later i think i'll take adil first and then we'll go into it because i have there's an interesting sub point to that adil please all yours no i think i think what is happening at the moment is everybody everybody wants you know to cherry pick the top athletes i think where we are missing out is creating an ecosystem and that ecosystem dipti says is not 4 years or 5 years it's 15 years and unless you create that ecosystem you will never produce medalists these the guys who are really doing well is you know just because they're super talented or they got the right opportunity at the right time but you will never be able to get 10 siddhu you know or 10 saina nevals or 10 uh, say neeraj chopras the reason being you don't have that ecosystem in place uh, let me give you a very small example we started doing inter district athletic meets only for under 14 and under 16 it is today become the largest 15 years ago today has become the largest grassroots level program in the world as said by world athletics it's two age groups 4000 kids 4000 kids from 520 districts of india come for a talent search it took us 15 years to cross 500 but today whether you look at the hima dasis the vismiyas the neeraj chopra they are all part of this system and we believe we invested in this 15 years ago and this is what i'm talking about that it's you know it's not that every four years these fancy corporate head honchos will get up and say oh why this okay i will look after this i will i will. after hima das became a champion 30 people wanted to her to sponsor her we brought her from zero grassroots level under 14 to that point where she became a world champion that effort has gone through the federation so i am saying that uh, people and that is where the government the government has supported hima das to come from a a barefoot running athlete to win the to win a world championship gold medal is a government corporate has not come in now corporates have jumped in so i am saying the corporates need to take a far larger view if they want to be part of nation building if they don't want to be it's fine and that and i was just looking at some figures there are 33 companies with their net profits over 3000 crores there are three companies the top three companies the net profit is 91000 crores 2% of that is 1800 crores which is equal to the sports budget of india of of uh, 2018 i mean it was 2400 crores or something like that now this is the sort of money that i'm talking about is available and i and i have a i have a theory of how that can that can work also which i've tried to tell uh, two governments to but nobody seems to listen but i'll come to that later Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, absolutely. Two things that uh, you know struck out for me. One is that every year, just after the Olympics, most funding bodies in sport and all get a series of calls from from uh, marketing managers who are saying, "No, we want to put in our contribution to sport by January. It peters out." You know, they just after the Olympics this year, the only three medals, and the same story will come. One point three billion people, only three medals, two medals. We are going to do something about it by January. They've forgotten their other targets they need to look after. So that that's one part of it. But the other part and this is one thing that somehow we've not done a great job of putting out which is that and i'm being very frank with you if we caught mr mukesh amani today and put him on a table and he said that uh, you know mumbai indians is a 300 crore company you know plus minus take or lose a bit is about 300 350 crore company and we put his entire balance sheet geo everything in front of him at 250 300000 crores and we told him to find that 150 crores he would struggle he would struggle to even locate that money in his share because it's such a small part of it yet the share of voice of the mumbai indians as an organization the share of voice that mumbai indians gives is much much disproportionate to that only 200 crore 300 crore company it is so in some ways i mean there is sport gives you a a disproportionate share of voice compared to the amount it takes so 
somewhere perhaps we are not being able to make that case well enough or you know for some reason it's not there but you know dipti i just going to quickly come back to you for something and the reason i'm coming back to you is that you know both you and adil csr is something that's important to you it's something that you're looking at and something you're very serious about now in the last 3 months the one positive that we have seen happening is that people have got together to raise money for their fellow indians in whichever capacity whether it is to these national law school people to get flights to the number of 3000 people that a kitchen near us is feeding which we are helping to people getting together to buy books there is for whatever it is there's a i wouldn't call it a renaissance there is an you know there's something is happening here where people are saying you know what i give i like giving and it's working for me and i would have thought that it would have lasted a bit and then it would have sort of petered out it hasn't because clearly one of the things is that making giving makes us feel good about things so there's something here about personal investment is there something there is there something that dipti that we can because see it's not even just harnessing them uh, i know that you are involved in play for india which is something that you're putting there is there something there that we can start channeling this i mean suddenly an indian has indians have learned how to give can we channel that jipti yes i think uh, play for india is one such example uh, you know when we when we when we actually conceptualize this we realize that the bottom of the pyramid in sport which is our groundsmen our cleaners our caddies and support staff entire income has shut down so what's happening to them we're talking about athlete always but you know and coach but what happens to everybody who makes sport possible for us so when we conceptualized uh, the play for india initiative it was primarily keeping this in mind and then it's wonderful to see how many stakeholders in sport players fed, you know federations and different people who've come forward and said we want to champion a cause and people have been giving it's just that now we're trying to direct it and show as a nation and under sport how many people really need support and how many people want to give i think um, even if you you know so there there was i saw a question on crowdfunding you know why can't people if every indian gives 100 rupees and thing we don't need anybody else's money but you know such campaigns have happened but uh, again everyone wants to know who the money is going to who's the beneficiary what's the ultimate usage of that money and there's so much um, you know in the social impact space and for any ngo i would say Uh, everyone's worried about where's that last buck going to and is it actually going to the beneficiary so i think wherever there are credible organizations who put up such platforms they're able to raise money but i i love the idea about what you're saying of we can you know sit in front of somebody like a mr ambani explain uh, you know exactly you know a very small percentage of money but they also invest in sport now what what is also happening it's it's just that 14 15 companies who are investing in sport i'd like that to broad base you know and because everybody is approaching exactly those 15 people for money or 15 organizations for money can we actually broad base that we actually started a program with the uh, dream sports foundation dream 11 uh, called stars of tomorrow and it was the first time we actually started investing outside of the olympic uh, sport we've picked up squash because if you actually look at uh, you know the commonwealth or the asian games you have that event but there was no funding for them so it was very interesting when we worked this out and it was a joint initiative and we're seeing money come in and their commitment as well even in this period but it it really depends on again do you get the right person to speak to and is it beyond those 14 15 people who've already invested because if you sit in front of the tatas they're doing it for 50 60 years the whole olympic movement in some sense also started because of them right so it's the same people so can as indians more people uh you know it broad base in some sense and more people come into uh sport because even when adil mentioned the numbers of those top 3 companies it's not just sport reaching out to them it's everything under the csr mandate you know there are about eight categories and everybody is reaching out to exactly those five seven uh you know companies so i just feel that if the awareness and the communication of funding sport and i think we all have that role to play of why invest in sport and if there is some sort of a campaign maybe as an extension of play for india to keep it going of why fund indian sport as a broader aspect there is something for us to think about joy with your absolutely. question absolutely and uh, roma welcome back nice to have you back uh, 
Uh, so you are sitting in front of somebody again. You've gone to somebody and said that okay, I want you to help fund the World Cup for me. So what do you tell them? What do you? Because see, the truth of it is that you are in many ways you have a very similar situation to Deepthi, in that that your people are not medalists immediately. India's chances of winning a women's under seventeen World Cup are very small. It's not that the women are the best footballers in the world. It's not that women's football is big, but yet it's a it's a story that transcends all that. What do you tell somebody? What do you tell sponsor? Because it's an important thing to know. Because a lot of the people out here need to tell those stories to people to get them to invest in sport. Okay, uh, Joy, uh, I agree with you uh, in the sense um, our story is a lot similar to what the challenges and what Dipti has just said. What we do when we go over the conversation that I have, be it with any stakeholder or a potential sponsor, is something very simple. are you looking at an immediate return are you looking at holdings are you looking at only then ipl is a product for you then isl is a product for me we are not the right uh, product for you to be associated with do you want to be part of the change do you want to be part of a start into a product and then help it grow evolve and be the key stakeholder say 10 year down the line 5 year down the line we are for you we we do not we are not here just for a world cup we have another asian cup afc asian cup 2022 coming in there is a long term vision for women's football we are not just talking to you when we talk to you about a 20 day world cup to you we talk to you with programs that engage children with football for all programs we here talk about issues that concern women and communities we talk about claiming reclaiming public spaces creating safe spaces for children through football corners programs now football corners programs is something which is specifically catered to governments where we are saying at a very low cost model open up spaces let communities come to the let girls and boys play together do you want to be part of this do you want to be a voice for gender equality and inclusivity we are for you if you are looking at that then please come please join us and be part of the change create history once again i know those words are similar to you but at this point of time we here talk about human legacy we talk about connecting with every individual at the same time we reach out to what do you say women uh, what do you say entrepreneurs women in decision making roles and we say you know what women tend to complain we do not have equal playing field we are giving you that this is the product please come and lend your voice men had a tournament in 2017 they filled the stadiums they came for it now it is your opportunity please come and support be part of the change support make football what we say when we go and we speak to stakeholder we say is make it a more gender equitable sport a national team is a national team it does not matter whether it's the under 17 men's team that plays or the under 17 women's team that represent it is a national player that's our message that is what we go and we speak to them and so far let me put it this way before this pause the response was good because people connect it's about emotion something you you would get what when we talk again i again here a little bit in terms of i'm being a little bit more passionate but i'll give you a very simple example as well uh, one of our strategies also not just with women we also talk to men progressive men especially men with daughters i'll i'll give you an example when we were running a campaign during women's international women's day one of the uh, athletes former sports person we had on board was viren riskina viren's little girl maya she plays football and she's passionate about football viren did a feature with us and it's something that resonates with me he said when i i've played football i've played hockey my father supported my passion to represent india to be a uh, to be in sports i want to give that opportunity to my daughter i want it to be like father like daughter those are the men we speak to those are the ones we say come on board wonderful wonderful that's your super thank you 
So, you know, what we're going to do is that, you know, we'll quickly go to some questions. But before questions, I have one last question for Yannick and for Desh, because as I said, I like putting them on the spot as, as ever. Yannick, quick one. You are now literally an investor in OTT Sport. That means you look at events that you can put on your network. You look at your platform. You're dealing with agencies. You're dealing with federations. What do you look for when you want to put a sporting event on your channel? Say an Indian sporting event, because that gives you an idea that people will look at it and say that what do they need to do to be on fan code? Uh, I think the most important thing we ask everyone is to be realistic. That I think we all, what Adil spoke about, what Roma spoke about, they're all great points long term. Most federations aren't thinking long term. I mean, no one is sitting with you and saying, here, I'll do a 20 year deal with you and lock my rights with you for 20 years. You invest in the next 10 years in my sport. So I think it's really important. I completely agree. And, you know, for me, it's different because part of my job is to invest in sport, right? That's that's part of our charter of business. But I think everyone needs to be realistic and say that we're going to invest long term. So, you know, you bring in partners long term. Uh, I think, you know, the challenges across all sport, we, we keep, you know, we've looked at looking at, uh, uh, you know, local cricket events. We put the I-League uh, on our platform, even though it's not the number one league right now in, uh, in football and in, in the country. We've looked at domestic, uh, we've looked at volleyball and basketball. It's always been this thing saying that we are willing to invest and we will invest, but we need to know that, I mean, that the investment we have is long term. There's no point in investing for three years, helping a sport grow, and then a competitor who joins, gets into the market three years from now, then takes everything that we've done. So that's, I think that's the key thing that, you know, it has to be a partnership. It's not a sponsorship. It's not like here's a donation. It has to be a partnership of saying let's work together to invest and build this. And we're not, uh, you know, this, this word of funding, like, you know, let's get funds from someone. I, I like, I, I don't like that word, right? Because that's a donation. And you give a donation on something. This is a partnership where you invest in it together. You get like, you know, whether you're getting someone to invest in football and athletics and whatever, you're saying that you put in money, the, the return may not be immediate brand sales for you. But it may be 10 other things which are measurable. It could be, as Roma said, it could be that saying that by doing this, we are going to get a thousand more girls to play football in a neighborhood where they never did. That's return. That's measurable. And that's something which is compelling. So I think that's really important for us long term and investing as, as a partnership. Those are the two important things for us. Perfect. I think that's, that tells you exactly what it is. Because, you know, you're not looking for a donation because donations don't last they don't really, they're not relations, they're one time relationships. And that's been the problem with Indian sport that people have put in money because the minister has been a passionate person in the right place. But that doesn't really build a sport because it's not a sustainable thing. When that minister goes, the next minister is not so interested, it doesn't work. Desh, I'm going to come to you for one last thing before we open it up for him for questions. So we've talked about the lottery, the other one big uh, 600 pound gorilla in the Indian sporting landscape, which we always discuss but never come around to is legalizing betting. There's so much money sloshing around in that system. Uh, is that a viable option? Can we look at it? I know we were very close to it for a, when Injati Srinivas was there. He was there in the UK. They did a lot of work looking at it. Where are we with it? Do we have any hopes? Because it is a substantial amount of money which, which we'd rather see not stay in the black market, come out in the open and at least help the sports that it bets on. So I think legalizing betting, just like a lottery, just like what Deepthi was saying, uh, in terms of the last mile accountability of a rupee, I think governance is is where a lot of these aspects maybe don't meet the threshold that a government would be comfortable with. I personally am yet to see a, a model that that seems to handle the issue of accountability. And I mean, you look at, you look at people like like Deepthi. I mean, you're talking about two percent CSR funding. It's 2% because of the effort that Go Sports is making, that JSW Sports has made, that two or three players in the market are making. There is a, there's a fundamental lack of trust in, in, in these kind of setups. And there's also stigma attached. Let's, let's be very clear. I think with you, when you look at betting, you look at uh, lotteries, uh, legalizing any of those, you have, to, you have to be sure that what you're proposing ensures that no one is exploited and that whatever you are making does get pumped back into the, into the system. So if, if there is a great proposal that actually takes care of a lot of the potential leakages, I'm sure there'll be plenty of people within the government system who'd be willing to, uh, to have a serious look at it, like you said, Mr. Srinivas was. 
the bigger challenge of course is is making sure that uh, that everybody is on board and understanding that this is no magic wand right what you, legalizing betting is not going to stop gambling or match fixing it will just take certain people who are open to having their accountable money with their uh, kyc's done putting certain money into the system and maybe replacing what they would otherwise put in fantasy sports but the underground market is not stopping so saying it is it is a measure to prevent corruption in sport i think that is where it fails no i yeah, exactly it can't be the magic wand that solves all your problems but yeah if it does bring a healthy cash infusion into indian sport in a controllable way i think controllable is what we are looking at how much can you control it and it i think that's always going to be a problem so thanks all of you we are now going to open the panel we've got lots of questions out here so i unless it's been specifically directed i get to decide who gets what and i'm going to start off with the first question which i think i'm going to go to desh again desh the question is uh, mizoram as a state has just given sport an industry status okay firstly what exactly and for all of us and there are a lot of people who may not be completely aware of what does industry status actually mean and after that if you could tell us is it something that is worth looking at from other states from the central government what is it that a industry status brings to a sport so industry status is something i think i've been hearing about for the last 10 or 11 years ever since i started practicing sports law sports and industry status for sports is something which comes across the table at every juncture i think it, i mean in a in a nutshell what it means is if you declare it an industry then you get a lot of associated benefits whether it's export uh, credits whether it's uh, certain cuts on taxes promotion having having sports infrastructure put in the in the list in the infrastructure list for india so some of those things have already been done in independent sections but overall declaring sports an industry is is something that uh, and you'll say i'm playing it safe but is better left to the states just because it it means so many different things and so many different aspects have to be taken into consideration before you can actually make it a central um, central policy i'm not saying it's not being uh, looked at it's just that it's not come it's not come to niti aayog as of now if someone else is considering it then then it's definitely worth a worth a relook i can tell you sports ministry sent it to finance okay thank you <laughs> we've been pushing it okay brilliant so next question i'm going to go to you yanik uh, it's from nobin uh, robin nirwani and he's saying that even though live sport action is slowly coming back the empty stadiums are here to stay do the panelists see uh, uh, an increase in revenue from broadcasting and digital rights because right now it's far more focused and with more international events being shown what is the difference in television viewing behavior that you expect and ott viewing behavior that you expect with this uh, pandemic current pandemic so i think uh, there, there are two challenges in that right i think the first is uh, the actual experience right so i while people are watching more uh, spending more screen time and spending more time on otts the experience that they are going to get of a live game is very different from what they did in the past you know the atmosphere of a stadium the atmosphere of crowds that all added to a viewing experience so that's going to take away i mean i was watching the epl and la liga over the weekend i mean over the week and it's a completely different experience so it takes getting used to and it's going to require all stakeholders to invest to make sure that they are delivering that experience which consumers were used to because if you don't you'll start dropping your viewership will start dropping your rating will start dropping so it's going to be really important and challenging for everyone to make sure that they're delivering value and you know uh, innovating to deliver value the second part in terms of actual value being delivered from a you know broadcasting revenues and stuff most broadcasters globally most broadcasters and we are direct to consumers so we are very different uh, rely on advertising revenues as a critical component of their business model and the reality is that in this situation the advertising model market in media is destroyed i mean that's like a polite word to it it's destroyed so that is going to impact what people can afford to pay if advertising was part of their business model brilliant that is actually fairly comprehensive so i'm coming to you roma and this is a question which i think uh, uh, i think you are aware of the background of this question so sort of roy asks 
accountability in sports governance is still a problem for example bangalore was supposed to be one of the venues in the under 17 football world cup in 2017 for which a fifa standard stadium had come up with the construction had never been completed what can be learned from this well what we can learn from this is again look in terms of let's put it this way football for football i probably use it more of a cricket analogy this is not a t20 game look at it as a test match and look at it yes the stadium was not ready but then again for us in terms of organizing when we look in terms of hosting we look at the window and then we look at the opportunities there will be a steady stream of what do you say tournaments football tournaments that we as a federation in terms of strategy are looking at a 10 year window to bring into india what the cities need to do is the host state governments again need to have a long term vision do they want to become an orissa look in terms of actively bringing in sports and creating a sports tourism or a sports development model then work closely with the hosting federations uh, and start planning in advance in terms of yes we look at a tournament we have a tournament coming in 2022 so we knew in 2019 which were two years in advance which were the cities we were looking at in terms of infrastructure we have to be honest bid for the afc asian cup for 2027 for men's tournament we would be looking at a fifa and a fifa women's world cup going ahead in 26 27 yes there is a strategy but then the states need to work together towards in terms of realizing but there also has to be an investment in grassroots and not just infrastructure at the high end at a stadium but also in terms of grassroots infrastructure reaching communities developing the sport overall as well no absolutely as as, as i'm want to say indians are we are very good at weddings so we always manage the big events on that day the what we are very bad at is building four years towards the wedding but other uh, question from you and it's from an anonymous question but uh, it's not it's a fairly relevant question a uh, question is what are you telling as a national sports federation now your your funding is this complete limbo thanks to what's happened with the pandemic what is the discussion that's happening between you and the government about now tokyo i think i think the government is absolutely on board government is on board um uh with the funding i don't think there is any problem with the funding um the department of sports sports authority of india um uh, they are i don't think that there is any plan to cut any funding of the sports department at the moment so therefore i don't see a problem at all okay and uh, uh, another question which is come from avirup uh, he says that sport is like a small cap mutual fund all stakeholders should realize it the longer the investment the better the result what is your view on this adil no absolutely like i said we talked about doing the inter district athletic meet now the new thing that we are doing is okay so now there are athletes in the district so they need coaches we are doing the largest coaches development program in the world in the next 3 years we are going to produce 5000 accredited level 1 coaches of world athletics we have already done in, from the beginning of this year 650 already done we have already done 95 level 2 coaches what used to happen is we used to send our coaches to the regional uh, development centers of world athletics so i said no 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 we can't do that we can't send one and two people so we brought the lecturers to india and we started from world athletics and we started doing this coaches program in india so that's the second thing the third thing we're doing is creating officials who so if there are districts every district as per our charter has to conduct a district athletic meet so who would officiate in these so we are doing an officials program so these are the sort of things that uh, that are happening absolutely thank you so much adil last question and this time it's for deepthi and deepthi here's a question and uh, they are saying that this is nidhi and nidhi is asking can we go and look at the model of say australian model and other models in world sport which are sort of australia heavily invests in the sport from a government base at the grassroots 
can we look at those models and can we suggest that other is there something there for us to learn is there something there for us to you know pick up and do with work with i think uh, there are wonderful models out there but i we must keep in mind the sheer population in the diversity of our country you know everyone keeps saying why don't you replicate the uk model or why don't you replicate the us model i think we'll have to pick and choose the best from each of these and see how it works here and we have to come up with our own center of excellence model for india because even between states we can't speak the same language right so uh, you know you're getting and most of our athletes come from very very humble backgrounds and even basic in the english is is it's difficult i mean we've seen it in some of the sports that we work with they've had to learn hindi and south indian hindi you know as i also speak that is very bad but we still somehow managed to you know get it across but um, so i feel that there is uh, definitely a, a requirement of actually uh, creating a unique model specific to india but is it something that you can just take and put it okay australian institute of sport is a fabulous model but i'm not sure that model will fully work for us um but we have an nis patiala and they are attempting to do it in couple of sports um we work very closely with weightlifting and we've seen what weightlifting has been able to do there and you know uh, afi also and their team over there we've been able to see how they've been able to work with the athletes uh um, the other point um sorry it just went out of my head but what i wanted to actually say was in terms of uh models uh, the center of excellence have now started and the government has been talking about it and has identified uh, about 8 to 10 different places across the country now what is that model that will be for a bangalore versus a, a northeast is going to be very very different because your audience your children what they have access to what can we provide is going to be very different so i i always keep saying this that we can't look at an international model and put it into india we have to indianize it and if mcdonalds did it for uh, their burgers in india only for india we have to do it for sport as well so no, no, i think uh, it's a very fair call when you think about a country which has the linguistic diversity of a european union but the funding of a really small european country like andorra or something like that and you combine it with the needs that we have i think it's uh, yeah you're not going to be able to pick up any model cherry pick a model and put it out there sorry uh, i remember my point i just wanted to <laughs> just so kind of, you know we were talking about uh, again uh, it's a slightly off the topic but in terms of uh, managing your education and sport right a lot of times we also say that the talent that we get also wants to study so what happens in that so that's also a model that the government has been working on in fact i'm on that committee where they're trying to we're attempting to create the national sports education board which means that athletes can now be part of an independent board if it yeah. clears you know where there's a separate curriculum and they can train and they can think it's not yet cleared but at least there is a thought process that we're thinking but even over there we've gone through the uk model the australian model the us model uh and we had to come up with something which is unique to india because in india you have so many boards that uh, we cannot have one separate thing only for sport so i think we have to keep that always at the center of all our decision making and strategy ah adil of course joy uh, no just just to supplement what uh, dipti said and on the funding model that we're talking about i am sure niti ayog can you know play a role in this it's a very simple thing there is, there are 33 country uh, 33 companies with net profits of over 3000 crores i'm just back to dipti's uh, 2% of that is 60 crores i'm saying i don't want 2% give one let and let niti ayog say 30 spots picked by 30 countries a 30 companies and and i'll tell you where it will help you will get a professional setup there will be a professional board all those and i we are we get a cag audit we are open to rti put put let the national federations follow rules let the national for, uh, federations come under the purview of the public act make them make them and we are we have accepted that i am saying that's let there be good governance and let's form a board equal number of people from federation the equal number of people from government equal number of people from a corporate and let them run a sport then you will run it more professionally you will get the best practices you see it's you have to understand if you have to fight the best in the world if we have to fight say 
the best company, Walmart or GE or whatever, you need an administration that is that good. And that will only happen where, where public-private partnership comes together. And Roma, for you, I think football, women's football is the next, I am convinced is the next big thing for India. So just keep at it. Good luck. Thank you. Thank Adil, you have you've really spoken my favorite words anyway because I, I'm a firm believer in that the dirtiest word in Indian sport is actually the word honorary. Because we have people who are not professional, who are running things which often either they're corrupt or they're just in a situation where they cannot handle the kind of things required to take their sport to the next step. So it's another, that's I think it's about a five-hour discussion between a few <laughs> of us later, which, which requires much more libation. But as of now, what delights me is the kind of positivity that we have all shown because nobody's sitting out here and saying, okay, it's doom and gloom, I'm going to die and it's going to be over, forget it. Guys, I think everyone's saying that, okay, this is tough, we've got to see our way through it. And they're looking at ways in which they can find a way through. And that's really important to Indian sport. Thank you all. You've been an absolutely fascinating panel. Thank you so very much for your time. And for all of you who are listening in, it was a pleasure taking your questions. It was a pleasure putting this forward for you. So from our side, on from the Sports Law and Policy Symposium, this is Joy signing off. Thank you so much.